welcome to lecture 13. So, today we will quickly look at commands, but uh, what I will do is I will look at a commands in a sort of simplified setting. Uh, so, we have previously looked at expressions and declarations, which are two important classes of uh, syntactical categories with different meanings. Uh, however, I do not want to complicate matters. Uh, by introducing commands on them. Instead, I will introduce commands separately with expressions and then later we will integrate them with declarations. So, for the for the purposes of this, this lecture, we will just assume a while language, which is like the most skeletally complete language for programming, uh, structured language for programming if you like. So, so what we will assume is that uh, we have a language with no declarations, but you can have lots of identifiers and all those identifiers are variables, variables in the imperative programming sense, in the sense uh, just like in Pascal or some such thing. So, and of course, for the present uh, while we are still discussing the various major syntactic categories, we will assume that our variables are only integer variables right so the so there are no declarations but we'll assume that we can freely um, update variables so we have and since there are no declarations we really cannot without a declaration we really cannot distinguish between a constant and a, and a variable so we'll assume that there are no constants Later when we integrate declarations into this imperative language, then we will uh, also look at uh, environments and so on and so forth. So, for the present, we will just assume that we have got this simple imperative language, which has, uh, which consists of a language of expressions, uh, which have literals, integer literals, integer variables and the standard operations, uh, let us say the binary operations on integers. Right, and uh, of course, uh, since we are going, to, uh, the a uh, uh, program in this language is just a command. I've written it in a bottom-up fashion, but really, the commands form the a complete program is just a command. Okay, and uh, since we have uh, condition uh, conditions here we require a sub language of boolean expressions also. So, I will assume a simplified sub language of boolean expressions right and uh, <coughs> since there are no declarations I do not want to complicate matters by allowing boolean variables. Uh, I will just assume that there is a boolean const there is a boolean constant in the language called true and uh, the only kind of boolean expression the uh, which can which which consists of integer expressions is an equality checking expression uh, so and otherwise you can have negation or disjunction i just chose or because well it, you have to choose one binary operator the rest is uh, simple one one unary operator one binary operator and one one constant besides uh, this equality of expressions and uh, our main grammatical category is that of a comma is, a, is that of a command whose basis of course is an assignment statement there is a sequential composition of commands as in the case of as in a language like pascal and there are these conditional commands and um, looping command right so so in the in the last week uh, in the in the last few lectures we looked at an expression language with declarations so it was a very much like a functional language here we are looking mainly at an imperative language without declarations because in an imperative language the main syntactic category are commands I mean. so so we let's look at this so if we have to give us semantics of the simplified language uh, we should in some sense, we should be faithful to the previous 
op uh, operational semantics that we have already given for expressions. Except that now since we are considering an imperative language with an assignment statement, there is an updation of variables. And so we have to, uh, we have to come up with a suitable concept which allows for updation of variables. So and uh, of course there are those usual criteria like uh, we should not, uh, we should not unnecessarily load this, uh, load our semantics with <coughs> pragmatic features. We should not unnecessarily bring in data structures or algorithms. We should just give minimal concise rules which will specify the language in machine independent architect architecture independent fashion. Right. So, so what we will do and something that you must have all uh, seen in your programming courses is the concept of a state. In fact, that is uh, uh, that is in fact the most, uh, the most common way of describing imperative languages that they are state based languages, right. So, there is a concept of state which is some abstract entity and for our purposes and for the purposes of most discussions on, imper uh, on the pros and cons of imperative versus functional languages, uh, a state is really nothing more than a variable value binding. In that sense, it's, it looks no different than what we said about uh, uh, declarations in the functional language. They were also just identifier <laughs> value bindings. Okay? Uh, so, however, here the difference, the reason a state is different from an environment for our purposes is that this variable value binding is really really represents uh, bindings that can change with time right as we will see the thing, uh, as we will see in the f uh, semantics okay so uh, so this the semantics of this while language is important because practically everything that you want if you want to talk about a simplified imperative programming language everybody would pick up a while language and and give it essentially just a state based semantics or give it its define its meaning in a state based manner. In all programming courses also you uh, this the, the while la the while language is considered the basic building block from which through which programming is taught and you talk about states and you talk about changes in state and so on and so forth. So, it is it is instructive to look at it. At the same time by looking at it in this simplified fashion, uh, we might also understand how to express uh, the semantics of Boolean expressions and in general what happens in the case of commands. Right? So, we will combine all these things in a single framework and then we will go on to actually looking at programming languages in which there have to be, in which this notion of state, this notion of state is not sufficient and you require to augment it with uh, a different concept right which which is r closely related to it and closely related to environments but is actually separate right so so we'll just assume that uh, expressions are evaluated in a state this is a very simplistic assumption and uh, commands are state transformers and that's that's really what so uh, that's really what happens in the case of uh, of an imperative language, each command can modify the state in some fashion. In and those state changes, the state transformations are irreversible changes, yeah? in the sense that uh, to undo the change requires at least as much effort as was required to make the change. Right. So, So, we look at just state as an abstract concept which has got nothing to do with well memory or whatever and we look at state changes. So, I would given two given two states sigma and sigma prime belonging to the set of states 
we assume that there is a predefined collection of variables v always since there are no declarations we have to assume an unbounded collection of variables available to us and uh, we will just assume that they all have some value uh, associated with them very often that value could be undefined. So, you could you could augment your uh, your value domain with some element called the undefined and uh, you could initially an uninitialized variable is could be regarded as something that is got the value undefined right. Uh, these things of course, have representations in actual hardware I mean there is a null value which can be used which is not which is not a data value belonging to any type right. So, uh, so I will consider the change from sigma to sigma prime as and represented in this fashion as a, as a one point change in the sense that sigma is sigma and sigma prime are everywhere identical except at the variable i okay and at the variable i whatever sigma might be whatever whatever may be the image of i in the state sigma in the state sigma prime its value is n and that is what this indicates right. So, what we are saying is that sigma prime is everywhere identical to sigma except at i where sigma prime has the value n and what sigma has is of no concern <coughs> or it's, it has some value, but it may not be the same as n yeah. Uh, and for all for all that means, so what it means is for all other variables for all variables other than i sigma and sigma prime yield the same value and for i sigma prime yields the value n right. So, this is this is a very important thing because the assignment statement is in involves a, a one point state change right. So, it is absolutely basic. So, we will go through this semantics of this language in a sort of rapid fire fashion, so that uh, it acts as a revision of whatever we have previously done and introduces a few new uh, <coughs> concepts at the same time right. So, the language of expressions well is not very different from whatever we have previously defined it is just that now we are looking at expressions evaluated in a state. So, you can think of it as um, uh, as is as replacing rho by sigma if you like, but uh, uh, so, but to be more rigorous what we what we have what I am uh, what we will do is we will look upon the evaluation we will look upon the set of configurations for expressions every. So, everywhere you carry a state with you in the execution of a program and the set of configurations of expressions is just the collection of all ordered pairs of expressions uh, and states right and the set of terminal configurations is just the collection of numerals along <coughs> with the state right. And so, we have to define the transition function. Uh, so, I have I have put a prime everywhere uh, to distinguish it from the last semantics, but you will see that it does not look too different from the last semantics right. So, let us quickly go through the expression language and um, you will see that it is more or less like the last one except that since I am considering uh, expressions to be ordered pairs of this form the meaning of an expression i in the state sigma is the value assigned by sigma to i in the state sigma right. So, it is just the value of the expression i in the state sigma and of course, in you carry you carry the state along with you every time. The meaning of um, an operation a binary operation on two constants uh, on two literals is really whatever 
assuming that that binary operation is already available in the underlying virtual machine is just whatever is the result provided by that operation in the underlying virtual machine right uh, and uh, this is the base case of left to right evaluation for expressions so this rule just says that given a constant m binary operation some expression e this goes to m binary operation e prime provided in the state sigma the expression e can move to e prime in the same same state sigma note that we are considering a very simplified language in which states jo uh, state there are no state changes that occur in the evaluation of expressions right uh, then uh, going further uh, given a complicated expression of the form e1 binary operation e2 in a state sigma our left to right evaluation strategy says that in this state sigma if e1 moves to e1 prime then this binary op uh, this complicated expression moves to this complicated expression in the same state right so the the, the rules e not to uh, e prime not to e prime 3 are really uh, a sort of a syntactic translation of the rules we gave e not to e 3 uh, for left to right evaluation of expressions under some environment right. So, now of course, uh, since it is an imperative language with, uh, with uh, conditional statements and looping statements, what it also means is that we have a separate categories of uh, Boolean expressions. So, in addition to, um, so in it, before we can actually give the semantics of the commands, we have to define the semantics of Boolean expressions. So, let us quickly look at the semantics of Boolean expressions. So, I will assume that we, the set of Boolean expressions that are possible uh, includes uh, all Boolean expressions that we already have and two predefined constants <laughs> t and f denoting true and false there is no reason why we should assume that uh, t and f have a representation similar to that of the constants there i mean they could be we could we could be type respecting in whatever we do and we might keep boolean constants separate from uh, let's say integer constants and uh, this is not uh, too um, this is not too outlandish this is not too outlandish because there are architectures for example, which are tagged. So, in many tagged architectures there is a tag associated with every, every memory location in which a type could be specified and storage is, uh, a storage is allocated only based on the type right. Uh, so, so, this is not too obscure or uh, outlandish and uh, we will as, as we did in the case of the declaration language though I have not explicitly specified it here we will also include these constants t and f uh, as part of the boolean expression language right. So, in addition to so, you can think of the boolean expressions as uh, having in addition an extra production of this form an extra true productions of this form and the language that we will be considering for semantic purposes includes these two. So, you can form uh, Boolean expressions with these constants and so on and so forth. In the process of evaluating a Boolean expression, you will you will also include these constants yeah as we part of the same. No, 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 no. That this true is a language specific syntactic entity. This T is a constant available in the underlying virtual machine. Okay, the two are not the same. I mean, uh, they are not exactly the same. If you want to make them the same, that is a different matter. But this true is 
Well, it's 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 in the syntax of the language, and you'll always be using this. You'll never in a program actually use this this T or this F. Right? This T or this F is some constant provided in the underlying virtual machine. Anyway, the, uh, the anyway, let's not nitpick too much because what will wh what will happen is that the semantics of this true will just turn out to be this T. I mean, that's it in a single step. I mean, there's there's nothing more to it. Okay, so the so it's not it's not a serious uh, it's not as it's not a very serious matter. If you want, you could, for example, have gotten rid of this true and put this T and F here. Uh, just as much as uh, having it separate, right? But uh, very often you have to distinguish between a s an element of a s language from an element of its meaning. Uh, this is something that. Uh, this is something that should be clear from whatever you've done. On, uh, for example, all of you have studied truth tables, right? So, if you look upon <coughs> Boolean expressions as a language, then there is a separate construct called true and a separate construct called false. In this truth table semantics, what you actually give are not this, the constructs of the language, but of a semantic domain which consists of two different values in which the true and the false have corresponding representations right i mean if you if you've been mixing up these two i mean that's uh, <coughs> it's it's not a it's not a serious matter but the distinction between syntax and semantics has to be made has to be kept clear i mean uh, one of the things that you do is uh, uh, you you actually uh, if you, you can define the language of let us say I do not know propositional logic or Boolean expressions <coughs> without the syntactic constants true and false. I may not have it at all. After all, why should I? I could just have uh, propositional variables, no true and no false. If I want a representation of true or false, I will take it to be of the form. Uh, a or not A. There is absolutely no need to introduce true into this syntactic language. Right? I mean, I could keep true and false purely in the semantic language and have a language of Boolean expressions which is totally expressive. It is not as if the constants true and false cannot be expressed. I could just have the, the, the various operators. I mean, I could have, let us say, uh, various Boolean constants. Uh, other than true and false. For example, I could just define the language of Boolean expressions or let us assume that you have uh, truth values, right? <coughs> so, I could just define it <coughs> to be a language which consists of uh, a set of Boolean variables, right? And uh, and just these operations not a a or a uh, a and a there is nothing which tells me that i should have true and false in the language at all right so i can define a complete propositional set. I mean, this is this is a complete set of adequate connectors for propositional logic or for Boolean algebra. I don't need to have the constants true or false. What is x? X is just a, uh, an identifier or a or a propositional variable or a propositional constant, a Boolean variable or a Boolean constant, other than true or false. Yeah, it's just okay. Now, what I now with this now this is a completely adequate set of connectors for Boolean algebra. What I might do is in specifying the semantics of this through truth tables, what I might specify is that my, my semantic uh, function is a truth value function which, which maps uh, the set of all 
I do not know uh, the, the set of all uh, 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 the set of all propositions. So, let us let me call let me call this the language of propositions. It just maps this to the collection of truth values T and F. Right, and I'll give, and what uh, the important thing to realize is that whatever is in green is the language of propositional logic. Whatever I specify in the truth table is really a function of, of the function called t, which maps given a truth value assignment to each of these uh, identifiers. It gives me a truth value, uh, truth value of compound expressions, and there's no true anywhere in the language. Right. I mean, uh, this should be uh, this. Maybe this has not been explicit made explicit in any of your previous courses. <coughs> but, uh, but essentially, it's that there is a semantic domain called T and F, which is completely different from your from the language of Boolean expressions or from the language of propositional logic. Right. So the fact that I've introduced true in the language is is just some I mean it's just something I just did I wanted to introduce a boolean constant so I introduced it but this it's in it's enough for me to have this these three connectives and I can I can get all possible propositions that I want yeah so this t and f belong to the underlying semantic domain they do not belong they do they need not belong to the language to the syntax uh, syntax of the language at all. It is a different matter that very often you introduce uh, in because you want to you want to specify that uh, the for example, uh, a, a tautology is an identity for uh, well is an identity for the and operation or a contradiction is an identity for the OR operation. So, what you do is you explicitly introduce two separate constants, let us say true and false to make it distinguish, distinguish from T and F into your language, so that you can specify those equations in a convenient fashion. But there is absolutely no reason why you should do that. I could specify a tautology as yes, of the form A or not A. I could specify a contradiction of the form A and not A. Yeah. So, so that the fact that I have introduced a constant into the language is, is, is really just my business. The, un, uh, it, the constant may not be in the language at all. It is part of, this thing is part of the language. What is there in the underlying semantic domain are these truth, truth values. Yeah. So, so let us look at, uh, so, so what I am saying is that this is not necessarily the same as this and uh, uh, your elementary knowledge of architecture or whatever uh, or hardware will tell you that there is an explicit true in Pascal, but what, what, it, what, it, what is its actual representation in the hardware is not true at all, I mean it is something else I mean, depending on the underlying representation. <coughs> Right. Uh, so, <coughs> ah, okay. Right. So, let us look at the semantics of Boolean expressions. Uh, so, we have this set B along with these two constants T and F and uh, we have a set of configurations which I will call gamma B which is just this entire set actually it should be this this B includes this T and F too. Okay. Uh, unless it includes this T and F you cannot have a a set of terminal configurations of this form, right. So, 
you might as well introduce you might as well introduce this as as equal to some b prime if you like and call this b prime instead right so uh, right uh, so uh, so you have this set of final configurations and uh, my first rule for the semantics of boolean expressions is just that the constant true evaluated in any state sigma it gives me this the t of the underlying the truth value of the underlying um, well machine or interpretation right and uh, a knot of this constant t is f this knot is again uh, an entity an operator of the language and it's got nothing to do with anything that might be there in the hard hardware right okay um, and uh, if you got a unary operator uh, so then th this is the basis of the knot operation and this is the induction step if you like so if you have a complicated boolean expression b which is being neg negated with a knot then uh, you can evaluate this not only after you have evaluated b and brought it down to a truth value right so uh, in if b is some complicated boolean expression it might have to be evaluated in several steps in which case it might remember that they are all tra syntactic transformations so symbol manipulations this b might go to some b prime and therefore this not b will go to not b prime and this rule will be applied several times till finally this b has been reduced to a truth value okay there should be one more rule which says not f sigma is t sigma 2 right so let me introduce that so there is there is a b1 prime which i will introduce here right so this is not f is equal to t right so and that gives me a complete set of uh, evaluations of boolean expressions except that our boolean expression language really depends upon uh, oh, uh, that is for the not operation. So, we have to look at the or operation. So, here is the here is the semantics of the or operation. Again, as in the case of the expression language, we will look at left to right evaluations, right. So, uh, if you have got an, a complicated expression of the form b1 or b2, then you first evaluate b1 till you reduce it to a truth value. then you evaluate b2 till you again reduce it to a truth value and once you have got two pure truth values uh, you uh, you can actually get another truth value uh, and of course uh, this this I, I, I this b5 should actually be b4 should actually be replicated separately for t and separately for f similarly b5 will actually have four copies depending upon this truth table right so i have, uh, i want uh, i have used this question mark inverted question mark and exclamation as being elements of the semantic domain arbitrary elements and the connections between them are given by the truth table right so actually there are like four uh, four different versions of b5 depending upon the truth value truth values that you are interested in and similarly several uh, versions of b4 one for each truth value but uh, i don't want to uh, stress it uh, too much because th these are 
elementary materials so. yeah so rather than use new variables and so on and so forth i've used these symbols as variables over the semantic domain Yeah. Okay, so this is as far as Boolean expressions are concerned and combinations of Boolean expressions are concerned except that our Boolean expressions, the only way we can form Boolean expressions are through uh, equality of expressions, right. So we have to look at expression equality, so which means the evaluation of equality is as again specified in some such fashion. It has to be related to the transition system for the expressions and uh, B6 and B7 just as they did for the expression language for binary operators in an expression language, uh, they do the same for uh, the equality where equality is really regarded as a binary Boolean operation between expressions. right? So, this B6 and B7 again specify, uh, B6, B7 and B8 actually specify a left to right evaluation of expressions to yield an appropriate truth value, where it must be understood that this the resulting truth value says that these two, these two constants, I have used three lines here to indicate that we are not talking about just equality of constants, but they should be identical as patterns. They should be identical as patterns and that is that is the only way a machine with no intelligence can really recognize equality. Given that it has no other information, what it can recognize as equality are just two identical patterns, right. So, if, if the two patterns that you get from evaluating E1 and E2 are identical, though I have given them different names here, uh, then you would say that this yields a true, otherwise it yields a false, right. Uh, now, there is there's one thing about this, uh, in our grammar, we actually specified the Boolean expressions as a separate grammatical category, which used the expression language. And whereas here we are treating Boolean expressions, the equality of Boolean expressions at essentially the same level as the expression language. We are specifying a left to right evaluation of an equality expression and so on and so forth, which uh, while it uh, makes pragmatic sense, it actually does not even make pragmatic sense, but assuming under a uniprocessor implementation that it makes some pragmatic sense, uh, it is really belaboring a point. It would be simpler to actually look upon this uh, replace all those three rules by a single rule of this form. So, this says that if E 1 sigma goes in 0 or more steps, 0 or more moves to some constant m and E 2 sigma goes in 0 or more steps to some constant n, then E 1 equals E 2 goes to some truth value depending upon uh, this depending upon essentially this condition depending upon whether the two constants m and n are the same or different right. So, this way we, you provide an abstraction from the expression transition system and also another important thing is that by giving a rule of this form you have clearly abstracted away from the order of evaluation of expressions. <coughs> this rule just says that, this rule says that in order to be able to conclude something you require two premises and it really does not matter in what order these two premises are proved. If you can somehow prove that E 1 sigma goes to this constant m sigma and E 2 sigma goes to this constant n sigma, then uh, and does not matter in what order, whether you evaluate in parallel, whether you evaluate non-deterministically, whether you partially evaluate one and then partially evaluate the other, it does not matter. In some order you evaluate them and if you get two constants then I can, uh, then this equality of these two expressions moves to some truth value 
in a single step. Whereas an application of B6 to B8 says that the equality of expressions really has to move in several steps based on the depth of this expression based on the depth of the Boolean expression E1 equals E2 right and what it does is that it makes no no difference in the abstraction level between the Boolean expressions and the expressions. And even for a simple language it is actually tedious to go around doing this. If you are going to do things in a recursive descent fashion it makes sense to do an abstraction at an appropriate level and leave that abstraction uh, as uh, a base case of a lower transition system. And so, so B9 is actually uh, what, what you might say an abstraction from the underlying transition system. It also does not specify an any order of evaluation uh, and, uh, and it, it well and it greatly simplifies the number of rules that you require which is important. If such a simple language requires so many rules then you can imagine what a real programming language would actually look like. Right. So, we will use this abstraction to, de, uh, to define the semantics of commands. So, we will assume the existence of the underlying Boolean expression transition system and the integer expression transition system and look upon commands as some high level entity in which see the, the whole point is that in this kind of an abstraction what we are saying is as far as the Boolean expression evaluation is concerned how many ever steps the sequential expression evaluation might take all of that is regarded as a single step one single step in the Boolean expression evaluation right. And similarly in the case of the command language we will look upon as many transitions of the Boolean expression evaluation and the integer expression evaluation steps as constituting a single atomic step of this level right. Uh, okay, so, what about the, uh, uh, the set of configurations? The set of configurations is just the set of commands uh, as usual I will use this uh, script C to denote the set of all possible commands, small c to denote the syntax tree of commands uh, of a command of an arbitrary command and uh, here we have a slight difference in the sense that once you have executed a, a program there is really nothing more to execute. So, there is no command at the end of the execution. Once the program execution has terminated, there is no command left. There is nothing to, what is left is only a state, right. So, your terminal configurations here are just the collection of possible states. So, at the end of a program, at the end of execution, executing a program, all you have is a single state, which is you can uh, you can look at all the variable value bindings. That's it. There's nothing else left. In the intermediate stages, of course, you have some commands left. So let's look at. So you can see that our uh, uh, command language. Um, has uh, two distinct types of entities for the intermediate state intermediate configurations and the final configuration okay so uh, the assignment statement all that it says is that the assignment statement can go in a single step to this to an updated state provided this expression on the right hand side of the assignment can go in 0 or more steps of the expression language to a constant m. Yeah. And that is in this in this in this setting that is all that is the meaning of the assignment statement. It is uh, you will see that it is it actually has some far reaching consequences. Um, Right. So, let us look at uh, the rest of the, so the assignment statement cons constitutes the basis of the command language right and 
that c uh, that that this rule c1 actually is the basis step right and now we have to consider compound statements so uh, well the sequential composition that we have got just like we have a sequential composition of declarations we could have a sequential composition of commands and uh, and so what does it mean the sequential composition just says that let us look at this, let us look at C3 first. If C1 can directly go in a single step in uh, C1 in a state sigma directly yields you a new, new state sigma prime with nothing in it, then C1 semicolon C2 in the state sigma yields a, an intermediate configuration of the form C2 sigma prime, right. Here is where the first state changes actually take place. So, this you can look upon as a basis for the sequential composition. So, if you have a whole lot of sequential compositions, this C3 tells you that if essentially that if C1 is an atomic command, that means it is it say it is a it is a it is an assignment command. In, in this language, the only atomic command in the command language is the assignment statement. So, if C1 is an atomic command which just yields a state change, then this sequential composition gives you this intermediate change. So, and C2 tells you the induction step for the induction on the number of semicolons that are there in a command, right. So, this is the basis of the induction over the number of semicolons, right. So, if C1 is not an atomic command, but is instead itself some complex command, then uh, there is no reason to suspect that in a single step it will give you a, just a state, it will actually give you some other command. Again remember that it is all symbol manipulation, so it should give you some other command with possibly a modified state sigma prime. Then the whole, then this entire program C1 semicolon C2 then moves in a single step to this configuration with the modified state, right? Okay, so let's look at um, um, so uh, so this is as far as sequential composition is concerned. C2 is uh, also applicable when C1 is something other than a sequential composition. For example, C1 could be a conditional statement or a looping construct. So, in the case of a conditional statement, we will assume that the Boolean can be evaluated in several steps possibly of the Boolean expression transition system to a single truth value. And if that truth value is T, then the effect of this conditional is just to get is just to get rid of C2 and everything else and only retain C1 as part of the configuration. Since our Boolean expression transition system did not allow for changes in state, the state remains the same. So, this C4 just specifies a transfer of control on evaluating a Boolean expression, that is it, nothing else happens, I mean nothing else happens to the program state. It is just a transfer of control that occurs and the control is such that C2 is discarded after consuming B1, B and getting a truth value T and uh, this is the program that you have to execute, right. So, uh, uh, similarly of course, if the Boolean condition evaluates in 0 or more steps, uh, this 0 or more steps is important because this Boolean expression if for example, in our language this would not be 0 or more steps, it would be 1 or more steps. But if you actually had, uh, if your T and F were actually part of your language, then there is no evaluation involved in this. So, it could be 0 or more steps, right. But since I, my T and F are not part of the language, this, this is, this, is, this will actually turn out to be 1 or more steps, right. So, if, uh, 
if the condition B evaluates to false, <coughs> excuse me, then you just discard this branch C1 and you have C2 left. And of course, there are no state changes because the evaluation of the Boolean condition does not change the state. And this also just signifies the transfer of control to C2, right. And the while statement is very simple. If the condition B evaluates to true, then you manipulate this while B do C and there is no state change. What is the, how is the control changed? You, you execute the body C and then you execute the while statement again. Okay. So, the, so what happens is that having evaluated B and having got a truth value T, the program that you have now left to execute is C is more complex than the program you started out with because you have to execute the body C and execute while B do C again. Right. So, so, so in the case of a looping construct, this is how <coughs> you specify in advance what the transfer of control is going to be. You first transfer control to C and then you append this entire construct again to the end. You sequentially compose this entire construct with the body C, right. Okay. And of course, if B is false, then this entire construct works out to a no operation and you get just a state sigma, right. So, this denotes the termination condition for the while loop. Right. So, this is a, this is a, a since uh, while loops and most imperative constructs are familiar to everybody, it is I decided to go through it very fast and anyway it gets too boring otherwise. Uh, what we have done is that we have for Boolean expressions we have specified complete evaluations. You could, you could actually modify this transition system for partial evaluations. By partial evaluations I mean short circuit evaluations uh, and you could even do parallel evaluation of Boolean expressions and you could modify all these transition systems also for parallel evaluation. Okay, I will stop here. Uh, this provides a brief overview of the both how to specify commands and Boolean expressions. We will get into the more complex issue of stores in the next lecture and why we require stores and why we require some modeling of memory. <coughs>